This conference will now be recorded. This conference will now be recorded.
Hello. Hi, everyone. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah. Hi, it's Elvis. Hey, good morning. Hey. So, shall we start then? Tomorrow, what we have seen, how to create an EC2 instance for a Windows machine, for a Linux machine. How to connect a Linux machine and how to connect to a Windows machine, right? Did you guys, guys uh, get the time to try this lab session? Connecting to EC2 instance, create thing. Anyone tried? Anyone tried what? Oh, uh, creating an EC2? Yeah. Yeah. Um, try, I, I tried a couple of them and it was pretty easy. I think the most the most uh, my my expectation are on on auto scaling and VPC. That's why I think it seems the most difficult for me. Okay. All right. So let's start our session again. Going to the EC2 section. So we already know how to create an EC2 instance by clicking on launch config and etc. So today what we'll do? We'll write a bash script to configure our EC2 instance, the Apache server, the PHP, whatever you want to do, we will write via bash script. So again, the same concept here, you click on launch con instance, you select exactly what kind of operating system you want to choose. Let's go with again with the Amazon Linux 2 MI, T2 micro here, the instance type. Next, configure instance settings. And again, we will not touch any of these things. We already know what are the different details of all the different parameters here. What we'll do here this time is into the advanced signal, we'll write a one bash script. Now, as this is a Linux machine, so here we'll write shell script. Shell script service shebang bin bash. It indicates the starting of your Linux machine, the starting of your Linux uh, bash script. Then, what we'll do, we'll Install the updates yum update hyphen y it will automatically download the updates and will install the all the updates Second let's install again Apache server HTPD hyphen y Then we need to start the service so service HTTPD start and Then we will pass one configuration file chk config HTTPD on. So now what this ch config HTTPD on will make uh, it will write a small configuration file in our HTTPD in our Apache configuration that defines in case if your server restarts that is your EC2 machine restarts then it will make sure the server also restarts automatically because whenever we terminate or when sorry whenever we stop our server all the services inside it running are also get stopped just like our normal computer whenever we do shut down all the services that are running in our computer is also get terminated so similarly if a server stops then all the apache server or the mysql server whatever the things you are running it will stop automatically so what this configuration uh, do that is again whenever the re server get restarted it will make sure the server the apache server is also automatically has started <clears throat> so this is a, a small bash script we have written so let's see if we have a if this bash script uh, goes right then it will definitely install apache server and it will start the server so that we can directly hit the public ip on the browser all right so click on add storage Going again default 8 GB of storage, add tags. Now we already have yesterday created one security room for the Linux machine. This is the one which has EC port and 22 port open. So I can use this port. Give you a launch. Uh, 
is some noise is coming from someone's background. Hello, Mina, is it, uh, I think it's coming from your side. Can probably mute. Uh, yeah, Lalit. it looks like somebody is watching a TV. Yes. Lalit, you being the presenter, you can mute. Uh, no, actually, the symbol is not there. There's no icon. Thank you. All right, so our EC2 installer is now running, and hopefully by this time we have uh, the system has automatically installed all the Apache servers and configure everything. Let's just copy the public IP and hit from the browser, and you can see our test page is running, which means our HTML page is running and the Apache server is already running. So in this bash script, you can pass this data. Now let's upload one document. Uh, let's upload an uh, entire website. I will download one HTML template from browser. And you can to upload the data. You can use FileZilla. FileZilla is a open source and it's a free service. Just click on to create a new connection, new site. And here you need to copy the public IP. Paste it here. Port 22. Logon type key file. That is, we have a key file to log in. Our user is ec 2 user. And we need to locate our file. E5. Again, I will go to the download section and demo mumbai.em file. I just click on connect. And then again, once again, OK. Now, here you can see it has shown me the entire part of my easy transfer. What are the documents available and everything? This is present in this directory. Now our directory of a public folder is slash 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 www slash html, correct? We will go to this directory and what we will do is we will upload all the document that we have downloaded, the file. So here is my the CSS, JSON, HTML, and declaration file. Everything is available here. So I'll just copy it and drag it to this location. Can somebody mute themselves? I get a lot of noise coming from the back. Now you can see here. Uh, everything is getting failed. You can see from here the failed transfers. Like whatever the document that I am trying to upload, everything is getting failed. So for this, what you need to do, you need to again log into your terminal or log into your console. And what you need to do is to become a sudo user and give ch mode 600 to where www and html to this folder you need to make it public once you give this permission now again if you try to upload the documents to your filezilla it will accept okay now do we need to know the Yesterday you did 400, today you are doing 600. Do we need to know that? 
Yeah, you for the exam. For the exam? No, not for the exam. This is the basic commands of the Linux. Okay. Is there um, is there something that you can provide? Hey, these are the basic commands. Uh, yeah, yeah. I will do this. I am creating a document, like multiple. Okay. Having the same request, I am trying to create a document. Uh, okay. It will take another two to three days, and then I will uh, share it with you. All right. Sure. You uh, did you run the command on the sudo? It looks like if you if you didn't run it like root, I don't know if you're gonna be able to run that transact that service you're trying to do. Maybe you should do like a sudo dash dash. Uh, I think dash i. Uh, no sudo sudo will pass a command as a root user. You can do this like sudo su also, and then you can pass a command. Then that is also fine. And without also yeah. that is also fine. Both are acceptable. Okay. But still, we are getting failed transaction. So, is this tool just like a win win SCP? Like, is it having yeah. the same functionality? SCP command. Yeah, like like win SCP. You know the the, the tool yeah. that will, you will be able to transfer data from a Windows machine to a Linux machine. Yes, just like that. If you want to send via uh, Linux to Linux machine, then it is SCP command. Secure copy. Mm -hmm. I think it is failing to copy directories. It's, it's, it's now approved. It's working. Yeah. It's copying oh. now. Yeah. All right. So all the documents is available here. Even I can visit through this directory now and check. Okay. Every day document is here. Now, if I hit refresh to the same uh, 13.2.32.87.182, I have the entire page here. The entire website is running on my server EC2 machine. Right. Any question, any doubt in this part so far? <clears throat> so all these things could be in, in uh, could could be in the script, right? Could you could have had all this in the script to like to do an echo echo command and push all this data to the HTML file? Right. Is that something that you can do that. You can do that. You can write the echo file uh, echo command here, and mm -hmm. so if you want to check the script again, and just go change the data. Okay. I have shared with you on the chat. You can also copy. If you just want to create a one small uh, document as an index.html file, you can write a small document. Uh, so, Lalit, probably the document that you are talking about, right? I have no background about Linux or Unix. So. Yeah, I know. So, yeah, they are, yeah. actually, there are multiple people are requesting for the scene. So, what I will do okay. is it will take me one or two days more. Create that document. I will okay. share with you the basics of the networking part yesterday and day before yesterday also. So for the networking, you can refer that file. For the operating system OS related thing, I will share it in a day or two. <clears throat> Alright. Yeah. Thank you. Now, guys, tell me. In this machine, I have uh, while booting up this machine, I have passed one command, uh, a bash script that will install Apache server, that will configure this Apache server, and it will start the server, correct? And then we have yes. manually uploaded a document, uh, entire website, right? So what if I take now a backup of this machine, what are the things that it will be included? If you take a backup, you will include all the data that you uploaded to the website, and then it will be, it will be on your, uh, your volume that uh, you it's, uh, it's, it's mounted on this machine right so the data that i have uploaded that part the uh, that data will be a part of the snapshot what about the yeah. uh, operating system and the apache server will that yeah, be yeah. up to yes everything will be taken in a snapshot right so how to create a snapshot is click on action go to the image and just hit on create image now here you can describe a name to the your image whatever you want let's say uh, 
Amazon, Linux with Archie and a website. Alright, and this will include 8 GB of storage. Great image. Now, creation of this snapshot is just a single click and it will want. Oh, sorry, where did you create it from? Sorry, you have to go to the action under actions and image and create image. Image creator. Okay, all right. Yeah. All right. Now, creation of this snapshot is absolutely free. And the uh, entire process takes only one or two uh, clicks here. But, but snapshot. You have to pay for the storage? Yeah. The amount of storage that you will consume for that backup, that is something that you need to pay. Now, from the left pen side, I have two options. One is AMI. That is basically the we have taken the AMI. So currently this AMI is in pending mode. That is, it will take a few more seconds to uh, be available in this. Okay. And also we have, when we taken this AMI, we also have one snapshot. The snapshot of your 8 GB of volume, which is completed now. So this snapshot will contain all the data that you have written in your volume. The operating system, the Apache server, the configuration that you have made, and the website every data is present in this 8 gb of volume now when we say that snapshot taking is completely free that is actually free but this 8 gb of size that you have again extended you have created another 8 gb of backup volume this is something that going to charge you and this will be included in the same 30 gb of free tier so whatever the free tier you have 30 gb per month it will be a part of that 8 gb so we have two things one is snapshot and second is the ami now this AMI. So the, the action, so the action does it create two things ami as well as snapshot yeah. or the same action has I... taken two parts one creation of an ami second creation of the snapshot okay now this ami just included how to boot the volume how to uh, use the volume uh, to create a new ec2 machine and what are the things that need to be included in that AMI in that uh, EBS in that EC2 instance. That's all the information per, uh, available in this AMI. But the actual data is available in your EBS snapshot. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> when I click, uh, if I want to replicate now, this is my one EC2 machine, Linux. Let's call it Linux one. Let's say I want to replicate my data. So the same procedure you need to do you need to create a snapshot if you want to exactly replicate the data if you want to exactly replicate your machines then the process is same you need to first create an ami now go into the ami section click on action and just click on launch so here you don't need to choose an ami in the ami section choose an ami in the my ami section you have that ami already selected by itself so again, you don't need to select this AMI. You can just go again to the T2 micro, whatever the instance you want to choose. Now, yesterday, uh, someone has this doubt that if I want to change the instance type for the new EC2 machine, then how to do that? So in this way, you can perform. In case if you want to upgrade or replicate the new EC2 instance to a higher version, then you can use this procedure. All right. Then here I select the so how different uh, Lalita, I have a question. Yeah. Sorry. So uh, how different? Uh, let's say selecting this AMI from the stock AMI Because see while uh, generating an instance uh, this AMI as well as uh, the uh, Snapshot got created right both of them. So how different is AMI from the stock AMI that we had selected while creating the very first Let's say server What's okay. the difference between this? All right, so if I click on launch instance and I select this EC2 instance, these are the core EC2 instance. This Amazon Linux 2 right. AMI is a core AMI. It doesn't have your data. It doesn't have the Apache server. But when you select my AMI and select your AMI, the one that you have just created. Oh, it will have Apache installed in it. Okay. Yeah, everything. So this is the difference between. Oh, the the snapshot will have data and this will have the core software. Right. That I have. right. Oh, all right. Okay. So I select this and then I can easily upgrade to any of the EC2 version I want. I can go with a okay. small T2 medium, T2 large, whatever I want. Even I can go with the same T2 micro again. Question. Yeah. 
So, um, so you so you have an image and an AMI, right? You can recreate your machine either from an image or from an AMI, but both of them don't hold the same content, right? Uh, sorry, didn't get you. Once again, sorry. So you can recreate your machine either from an image or from an AMI, right? Right. You can create another instance, which is going to be similar to the same architecture of what was previously created, right? Right. So, but the understanding is an AMI and an image don't hold the same content of data. Yeah, image, right? AMI both are same. AMI and and yeah. and and, and an image are both the same. Yeah, when you click on create an image, it basically creates an AMI. An AMI is an in terms of Amazon, it's an AMI. But in normally when you create a snapshot in your local machine, it will be called as image. Like normally when you take a backup of your data, that is called as image. The if you want to install any operating system, that call is as image. But in Amazon Dub, it is named as a AMI. That's why when we create an image, it's uh, named as a AMI here. That's the difference. Only the naming convention difference here. Okay. Another question that I had just before we go is about the chickconf the chickconf command that you use in the script. Does that work on on Red Hat Seven too? It looks like uh, it's another command that works on Red Hat Seven for chickconf. Yeah. Uh... Yes. A chk configure it uh, changes from operating system to operating system. Even you can use uh, you cannot use the uh, yum command. Okay. So it looks like you're running on the Red Hat Six. Uh, for this T2 micro, or is that is that something that I should I should think about? Or is like that? Yeah, this is Amazon Linux AMI. Based on this Amazon Linux AMI, on the top of that, we have a Apache server. Okay, all right. I, I thought maybe it was Red Hat, or maybe Santos Seven, or maybe uh, an Amazon image that is maybe uh, of Red Hat Seven. Okay. Yeah. I'll go ahead. So I select here T2 micro, and then I can configure instance settings. Now here, I don't need to provide any advanced details. In case if I want to add more details while creation of this machine, like let's say at this time I want to install MySQL or any other data, if I want to write any other data, I can write the batch keeper here again, once again. Add storage, add tags. Now let's tag it as Linux 2. Again, you can create a new security group or you can attach an existing security group. I'll go with the existing one, the Linux security group that we have created yesterday, which has 22 and 82, 80 port open. Review, launch. So what you're launching is the same as what you had before, what you created an image. It's just a replicate copy of the uh, previous image, previous uh, EC2 machine. Okay, but without website content, right? Yeah, so it does. Oh. Right, this one does not have a website content. Oh, no, I think this one does have a website content because he created an image with it. Right, it's a, exactly a replication copy of your existing image. Yeah. This one. Yeah. Oh, does it have even the website content as well? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Because the AMI okay. is associated. This AMI is associated with. Ah snapshot so while we have created this data while we have replicated the data the 8 gb volume has been already copied to your newly ec2 machine so in what scenarios then i'll be you know, using snapshot exclusively then now there are two ways to use a snapshot one specifically for your ebs volume and one specifically for your ami now if you want to replicate your ec2 machine or if you want to migrate your ec2 machine to another region then in that case you need to create an AMI for that purpose you will require this snapshot the snapshot is always a part of an AMI the another scenario oh, they always go hand in hand that means AMI and snapshot yeah. so I can't write so visualize snapshot as an independent let's say uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. right yeah that's what yeah. I, I thought so too because snapshot is something you know in a VMware or Hyper-V normally we take one snapshot before we make any changes so just in case if the changes get like, you know, that screws up the entire production or something, and then we restore the snapshot. You have that option. I think in, they are too right. I have, 
they are doing okay because in here i see that the create image is something like you know when we want to create a image in the windows you know for accounting group we you know like we build a uh, uh, i don't know windows 10 and then we put the accounting software we put all the printer drivers we put all the uh, uh, it's it's like you know whatever is a necessary thing and then we create an image of that and then we apply the image to any new laptops and desktops and everything and then that is the image here i think you call it a create image and then which is amazon ami all right i get it so the snapshot part that i couldn't get it the image part i get it yeah right. this is a new concept for me like having two let's say file sets kind of thing so here right. we have two ideas to understand, so understand this what exactly am i do you think what exactly an ami is just forget about this yeah, that's it. that you have created the uh, default uh -huh. email that you have what exactly this emi says no this will have the required operating system right so this is just that's a it. template this is an ami is nothing but a template that has all the description about your operating system and the packages that you want to install for example this amazon linux ami the first image so this will include all the packages which is required for AWS command line, Python, Ruby, Perl, and Java. But this will okay. not have the data which is required to install all the dependencies, the Python, Ruby, Rail, whatever you have see here. This data is actually not a part of this AMI. Behind this AMI, there is a snapshot available at the Amazon data center. So whenever you select this AMI, that snapshot get copied to your EBS volume. Okay. Have to I have something. Yeah, I have something to help with. So the snapshot is a point in time image of the entire machine. A point in time means whatever is running at that time, the snapshot take is taken, is is being saved for in case of recovery. So the snapshot is mostly in point in time. So you set up your system to have snapshots like periodically on your entire system that you can help restore. Maybe. A database or a particular thing that was running at, at the point in time so snapshots are mostly point in time and then different from maybe image which is like the entire operating system so how can i uh, say let's say understand for this ami this is a snapshot let's say both are not tied to each other right at one place so amis are placed under images and these snapshots are placed under abs right if you could really know that they are so here you can see so for this ami this is created by create image and it is associated to a particular AMI ID. You can see here it is for the AMI ID 04012. And this is also part of the same 0411A4. So the image ID is part of this. Now, again, I will say while creation of this image, while creation of this AMI, you can give the tags here. So whenever you provide a tag, it, you can see here both the names to the ami and to the snapshot <clears throat> now one important again thing if you try to delete the snapshot you won't be able to delete the snapshot because it says this snapshot is associated with this particular ami so unless you delete that ami you cannot delete the snapshot manually now two things again okay, okay? one is the ami and second is a snapshot now, when you see Amazon AMI, the list of uh, AMI that AWS shows you, every AMI is associated to a snapshot. You only see the AMI because the snapshot are private to the AWS only. They just give you public access and you create a EC2 machine out of that. Whatever the Java, Perl, uh, Python dependence that you see, that particular AMI, that data is actually present on the AWS snapshot. AMI is just a template that describes how to boot the machine and what are the parameters is included, what are the features and the, all the description about your AMI. It's just a template. Whereas the snapshot has all the things whichever you require to put your EC2 machine and the data which is residing in your EBS volume. Whatever the data that you have captured in that EBS volume, uh, creation of an operating system, then installing any packages if you want, uploading your personal data, whatever the data you have uploaded, all the data which has returned to the email volume is a part of a snapshot. Now, AMI and snapshot takes place uh, into two groups. Like uh, there are two ways you can, uh, there are two purposes of creating an AMI and a snapshot. 
if you want to replicate or migrate your infrastructure then you can create an ami or if you have a point in time recovery of your data then you can go with this ami if you just want to specifically create a backup of your ebs volume then you don't need to create an image out of that you can just simply create a snapshot of your ebs volume for example for my linux machine i have 8 gb of uh, boot volume available and i also i have installed about uh, created 100 gb of extra volume i have attached 100 gb of extra storage to my ec2 machine <clears throat> So if I don't want to uh, have this 8 GB of volume uh, snapshot, then it is totally fine. If I want to have a data which is written in my 8 GB of volume, the operating system and everything to replicate my data, then I can take an image out of it. But if I want to take a snapshot of this 100 GB of data, I don't need require to create a EMI. At that time, I will only create a snapshot of this 100 GB of volume. So that if I have two EC2 machine, if I want to attach this data to the two different EC2 machine, then I can replicate this EBS volume only. At that time, I don't need to create a, another EC2 machine, uh, another AMI out of that. So here two things here. One, the AMI and second is a snapshot. An AMI is only used to replicate the infrastructure to create, a, uh, to migrate the infrastructure to for point in time recovery. And also it is used for auto scaling purpose. Now, what exactly the purpose of having an auto scaling with this AMI? I will describe it later. But the another thing is snapshot. A snapshot is just a copy of your EBS volume. Whatever the number of GBs of data you have, if you want to replicate only the EBS volume, for that purpose, you will require a snapshot, not the AMI. If you want to have a snapshot of the entire operating system and every other details which is configured in your operating system, in your EC2 instance, at that time only you will go with the AMI option. For the rest of the time, you will only go with a snapshot. Now, is it something clear? AMI and the snapshot? Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you. So, I have one snapshot and one EBS AMI. And out of this AMI, I have created an another EC2 machine. So, technically, if I just copy this AMI and pass and, you know, and open it to the browser it should throw us the entire website again right it will show or not don't yeah, ideally it should show ideally it should show but unless the ports will have to check no, it, it will show the entire website i'm sure you replicated everything from the existing yeah. uh machine. Yeah. ports are yeah, only thing data the yeah, only thing I'm, I'm not sure is whether this was um allowed to be a public folder or something uh why ad port is open it is having a public uh, ip which is running in right. cloud one so it is everything in public mode so i think it should give us all the data on from the browser okay definitely public if you didn't specify it to be private it's going to be public but if I enter this data here, it will not show me for sure. But it's giving us data. What is the exact reason? Like you have the data which is written into the two different formats, the two different IP address. Now, EMI is something that captures the data only whatever you have written to the disk. But if you remember our bash script, that we have passed one command that is service HTTP start. Now, service HTTP start is not a part of a data which you write on your disk, correct? Mm -hmm. So, if you forget or if you remove this command chconfig HTTP on, then it will not create a server for us. It will write all the data, it will create an Apache server, but it will not run that HTTP server. But if you make sure that chconfig HTTP on is available is pass you have already passed this command you have already configured this data on your apache server then every time you reboot this machine you don't need to go to the terminal again you don't need to connect to that ec2 machine and run the server again now as a part of a uh, lab you can try this so, 
this is our bash script what you can try is without this chk configs try running this command into a ec2 machine take a ami and after taking a ami launch another ec2 machine all right and you will find that your machine will not be creating or running any server inside it it will have all the apache server details it will have the chk uh, the data that you have uploaded the website everything is available but it will not pass this command service http start because this this command doesn't write any data to your eps volume so it will not pass this command yeah. but in case if you pass this command chk config uh, Config. Yeah. Yeah. Then mm -hmm. it will write the data to your HTTP yeah. server to your HTTP logs file. That every time your EC2 machine is restarted or uh, you know started the new server, it makes sure that your server is running up and healthy. So, so you're saying that if you have to do an image. And deploy another machine from that image you should you must make sure you run this chicon command to make sure everything starts correctly right exactly as a part of your production ec2 machine production account you must pass this command now this is for only apache server if you have any ingtech server or tomcat server whatever the different servers you are using whatever the respective command is you should pass it so point to consider point to note is why we are taking an ami what is the importance of creating an ami and what are the things that you should must consider before taking an ami because this ami is going to replicate our infrastructure replicate going uh, is going to replicate our ec2 machine if it is an auto scaling mode the same ami we will be using and if that ami in the auto scaling mode is creating a new ec2 machine and is not having that power to run uh, to run the server automatically then every time this machine creates it has no use just imagine you have four servers all right and auto scaling mode it has created another server this another server has the capability to update the service to install the apache server and to write whatever the data you have written in your website it has all the data, all the capability to upload the data in that particular EBS volume. But uh, but that newly created EC2 machine is failed to run the server, to run the EBS volume, to run the uh, Apache server. Then what is the use of that newly created auto scaling EC2 machine? Correct. This EC2 machine will not have any server running, so it means it will not handle any load. So before you take an AMI, make sure you pass this command chk config http on so that every time your new machine will create in auto scaling mode, it will run this command and it will make sure it can have the capability to take a load and uh, you know uh, send back the response to the users. Otherwise, every time whenever a new EC2 machines come up, you need to log into this machine and you need to start the server again. All right, this is the use of writing an AMI and before you take a AMI, make sure you have everything running in your system. Now this is an AMI. We know how to launch this AMI, just click on launch and it will create an EC2 machine in the same region. But what if you, if you want to create or uh, migrate this infrastructure to another region? Now before that, we have a details section here which describe all the information about our data. Now again, if you want to check, this AMI belongs to one block device that is the data where this AMI data has been stored and it corresponds to the snapshot, the one that you have created just now, which is attached to that snapshot ID 05CFF. 05CFF. So the AMI is only the template but the data is attached to this block device which is a part of this snapshot All right now the next part is a permission permission defined two times of permission if you want to share this AMI publicly to everyone with every AWS account 
you can do this or if you want to share this AMI privately with another AWS account then also you have an option to do that what you need to do is just click on edit and here is the option public and private publish means when you click on save it will be available to public all the AWS users or in different different AWS account can use your AMI to create an EC2 machine when you select the private you specify the account ID the exactly 12 digit of account ID to whom which you are, with which you want to share this AMI so if I provide your AWS account ID to a digit you will be able to find this AMI and you will be able to replicate the entire infrastructure entire EC2 machine in your AWS account so this is sharing of your AMI ID publicly and privately now what if you are if somebody has shared a AMI ID with you so how will you get it so again here you can see this is owned by me that is the one that you have created these are all the AMI list of AMI which is created by you which you are own this AMI if you click here there are two other options available public AMI and private AMI if you click on public images so the one that you have shared with publicly the list of all this here you can find here these are the different uh, AWS users that I share their own AMI you can find there are 40,011 AMI IDs available in this Mumbai region which is publicly available if you want to create a EC2 machine out of this uh, you know AMI you can just select and click on launch but how would you know what is on the box yeah of course that you don't know you can uh, okay this, uh, uh, that is from the description I think you can get this or you don't have that information uh, what exactly the content of this AMI okay the tax will have by any chance yeah the if, the, if the, uh, the exactly the guy that has uploaded this for uh, you know AMI if that has provided any tags here then it will work for you then you will get it what exactly this belongs to so Lalit if uh, yes <clears throat> so if our instance had two EBS volumes say one is that 8 GB and another that 100 GB that you mentioned Correct. and we took a snapshot we get two snapshots right one for 8 GB and one for 100 GB no. if you take an AMI if you take an AMI snapshot then you will have only 8 GB of data as a part of a snapshot if you oh. specifically take a snapshot of your EBS volume, you have an option which one you want the 8 GB of volume or the 100 GB of volume. Now, for instance, I have two EC2 machine running the Linux 1 and Linux 2, and both are associated with 8 GB of data. Correct? 8 GB of mm -hmm. volume, both are added. Yeah. So, if I go to the volume section here in the EBS volume side, I have both the Linux available. 8 GB of data. This is the, exactly the EBS volume which you have attached to your EC2 machine. So, yeah. in case if you want to take a snapshot of this EBS volume only, the data which you have taken, you can just click on action and create a snapshot. So, you will have only this 8 GB of data snapshot. Let's say you have created another volume of 100 GB. Here you have clicked on another create a volume and you have created 100 GB of another volume which you are associated with your one of the EC2 instances and inside this 100 GB volume you have certain data now in that case you have three volumes here 8 GB, 8 GB and 100 GB again you have a complete control what snapshot you want to take any of this 8 GB volume or the 100 GB volume you can take any snapshot out of it this is directly taking a snapshot of your EBS volume and this is something that is a part of your AMI. Now with this volume snapshot, the snapshot if you take here, you won't be able to create a machine. If I create a snapshot of this volume and I, uh, if I create a snapshot of this volume and try to launch the EC2 machine, that EC2 machine will not have the data to boot the EC2 machine. That will have only the data which is written in this volume. But to invoke all the operating system, all the data that you have written, we must require an AMI. <clears throat> so what does it mean? You have 8 GB, 
of data which includes the boot information and another 100 GB of data which having only data right let's say you have two snapshots one 8 GB of snapshot and 100 GB of snap here if you have taken this snapshot manually that is going to the volume and taking a snapshot this 8 GB and 100 GB of data snapshot will contain the data which is written to your disk which is available on your EBS volume but this volume will not be able to create another EC2 machine and have all this data you can replicate the data but it cannot create another EC2 machine for you to create an EC2 machine you need to create an AMI AMI, okay. This AMI will invoke all the operating system which is residing in your snapshot and the application server and everything. This AMI has a future to invoke all these features. So, for example, now let's say you have 8 GB of data, 8 GB of snap available, right? Then you go to launching an EC2 instance. Okay, you go to launch an EC2 instance and uh, you select a particular AMI and then for uh, creation of the EBS volume you attach this 8 GB of SNAP so what will happen then to your first EC2 machine you are creating a launch machine uh, you are launching an AMI out of a you know EC2 machine and then you are attaching this 8 GB of SNAP which already having a operating system so how this works now And what that EC2 install will contain? Uh, I think that will contain only the operating system. The files will not be there. Uh, sorry, uh, can you be a little loud? I think uh, just the operating system will be there. That's all. Uh, the 100 GB snap that uh, is available it will not be there. No, it will, it will contain the, only, only the 8 GB, only the 8 GB snapshot data, but it will not contain the 100 GB data snapshot. No. If you create a new machine, then it will contain the 8 GB of AMI data that you have selected for creation of your EC2 machine. And it will also contain another 8 GB of SNAP data. Because this is not a part of an AMI. This is a part of a snapshot that you have ex explicitly allowing this to be a part of a new machine. So 8 plus 8, 16 GB of data. There will be a two volumes, one with the 8 GB of SNAP data whatever the operating system and other data that you have and this new machine will own have its own AMI because the snapshot that you have taken is not an AMI that's why are you getting this <laughs> okay there goes my answer <laughs> <laughs> it's okay so if you are not getting that's fine we'll see the EBS section and then once we uh, come to know what exactly the EBS volume, how to create a EBS volume, how to connect multiple volumes, then it will be more clear for you. All right. So, wow. The so, Lalit, one follow-up question. Yeah. I'll be sorry to interrupt you. So, let's say in this scenario, the scenario that you are explaining, that you have taken a snapshot of 8 GB, I didn't take AMI. And if I, if I create a new machine with 8 GB AMI and attach this 8 GB of snapshot. So how can I explicitly attach 8 GB of snapshot while creating the EC2 machine? Just you need to click on launch EC2 machine. Mm -hmm. Like the AMI. Okay. Uh, whatever the EC2 micro uh, storage. And if out of storage, you can attach any other EBS volume that you want, 8 GB, 10 GB, whatever you want. And if you want to make a part of that snapshot, the one that you have taken, you can search that snapshot here. Whatever. Oh, okay. And okay. you can copy all the data with whatever you have in your EBS volume in that particular snapshot. Thank you. Yeah. Now the question is how to replicate this data into another region. And before that, if you have if somebody has shared with if somebody has shared with your private email with the you know uh, account to account then you will find in the private email section so this one by me the one that i have created this is the public images the list of that publicly available and these are the private images now in case if you i am currently in mumbai region in case if you want to replicate this entire infrastructure in us uk anywhere 
10 tests you need to do click on action copy this ami and here you need to select the destination region let's say north virginia and click on copy ami now in the north virginia section in the ami you will find one ami which is will be exactly copy of your data now in case if you want to create an easy to machine you just need to click on launch uh, just wait for a few seconds here and then you can click on launch machine and you can run the easy to machine in north virginia this is how you can replicate your infrastructure or <laughs> your infrastructure in another region all right uh, and uh... Lalit, the EC2 instance uh, is not required to be in uh, pending or stop state to replicate. No, no. In the running state itself, the, all our EC2 machine that we have created snapshot were in the running state. We don't require a data, our EC2 machine to be in the stop state. But what will happen if your EC2 machine is in running state and if it is performing any kind of actions? like uh, running a party server and anything if anything data is been written in your disk then the moment you take a snapshot only the data which already been a part of your EPS volume will be only take a part of your snapshot the data which is you know transferring between your epimelo storage and your persistent storage will not be a part of the snapshot because snapshot takes only place to the data which is already a, which is already written to your EPS volume so the recommended uh, method is to put the EC2 instance in a restricted state and then replicate. Yes, that would be a good option. Like if you are continuously having a high traffic, if you are at that during the time, if you are creating a AMI, at that time you must stop the EC2 instance and then create a backup of that volume. Or what you can do is you can uh, do this AMI or taking a snapshot during the time when your system is idle during the night time or anywhere like that <clears throat> well in the production systems it's uh, it's not practically possible to put down the system and then uh, replicate so during so, what will happen like if you are taking a bag for example this is my ec2 machine and uh, this ec2 machine is serving multiple requests thousands of lakhs of required it is serving on the browser so definitely mm -hmm. if this is a dynamic application which is running in my ec2 instance and if it is writing certain data in my ec2 machine in my ebs volume then what will happen if i'm taking a snapshot whatever the data which is already a part of your ebs volume only the data will be written into your snapshot the data which you've been requesting and the response is sending from the epimelo storage system the ram to the EBS volume, the data will be lost. Only that particular data will be lost. And which is very common. Even if you take a snapshot in your Windows system, in your local machine, then also it works like that only. And to replicate the data completely uh, with less uh, RPO, uh, we need to use an, another third party HA systems, right? Right. Okay. So, so yeah. that script you yeah. showed us, uh, Lalit. Yes. That uh, uh, is is that only for Linux servers or for? Uh, uh, this is only for the Amazon Linux AMI because it has a command yum install and yum only supports to the Red Hat Vesa operating system. So it will work okay. on the Red Hat Vesa system or the Amazon Linux AMI. Or if you are using a Ubuntu, then you can pass apt hyphen get, and it will have apt hyphen get Apache two install, and uh, service system CTL HTTP uh, Apache server start. You can find all this stuff okay. on the Apache side itself in the documentation. Okay. So if in if you want to create a Windows instance with all web servers and all, we can't uh, do it like for Linux, right? Yeah, no, for the Linux, you don't do that. You need to always pass oh, it or you can just manually insert, uh, enter into that okay. machine and do this. Okay. 
So we have seen the bootstrapping, bootstrapping of your EC2 machine, providing the script and running up your EC2 machine. Then we have seen two parts, taking an AMI, creation, replicating of your AMI to another EC2 machine and migrating the AMI to another region. In this section, if you have any doubt, let me know. If not, then we can go ahead and to start our EBS section. So that what we are talking about the volumes creation, attaching to volumes and what exactly snapshot is, we can work on that. Lalit, I wanted to know one thing. I'm saying uh, we have two EC2 instances, the uh, Linux AMI is working. Right. If, if we want to start one from access one from another, uh, sorry. How do how do you do that? Access one from another means. Yeah, but let's say when we're trying to access in uh, Windows instance, we we can do RDP to that particular okay. instance. Okay. We can... So you mean to say if you want to connect one Linux machine to another Linux, right? Yeah, that's true. So what you need to do? Just you need to copy this public IP. You need to connect to one of this machine. Okay, so. I am connected with the Linux one. So, using source. Now, to connect to the Linux 2, what I need to do is what I need to have is the key pair, right? The demo key pair. Mm -hmm. So, I need to first create a key pair here. Let's give create a one key pair, VI key. Click on I button or insert button. Then I need to copy the data which is in my key pair. Paste account all the data. Click on escape colon WQ to write the data. Then again the same procedure. Just like your normal Linux version, normal Mac version. CH mode mm -hmm. 400. This is a one time job key. And again the same command SSH hyphen I key name the name of your key pair EC2 hyphen user whatever the user you have you want to EC2 hyphen user and now you have two options to connect one with the public IP one with the private IP you can access via any of this IP because this is internal communication from one machine to another mm -hmm. so you can use any of this I use private IP and hit enter click on yes and you have logged into your private machine. Previously, I was in 172.31.18.239, which is the mm -hmm. private IP of my first machine, 18.239. Now I have connected to 172.31.26.93, which is the second IP, uh, private IP of my second EC2 machine. So in this way, I can jump from one machine to another machine within a VPC. All right. All right. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So let's see the another storage system that is EBS. Amazon EBS provides a persistent block storage volume for use with Amazon EC2 instance in the AWS cloud. So it is a persistent storage system on the AWS cloud. Each Amazon EBS volume is automatically replicated within its ability zone. Now this is a feature provided by the AWS that whatever the EBS volume that you will create, it will be automatically replicated in its own ability zone. To protect your data from component failure, in case AWS fails to perform, uh, fails to, you know, uh, create the EBS volume or to continue that EBS volume, if any kind of uh, mistake or uh, the data centers goes down and it affects to your EBS volume, then it will make sure to create another EBS volume for you and it will have the exact data copy in that EBS volume. Now this replicated copy is a part of an AWS. You cannot use this replicate copy or you won't be able to see on your AWS console. This is something that AWS stores at the background. 
AWS automatically replicates within its ability zone to protect you from component failure, offering you high ability and durability. So in that case, uh, from as it is protecting you from the component failure from its own side, because this is AWS responsibility to maintain the data center. So it protects your data by replicating the data exactly in its own system. It is a consistent and low latency performance. Now there are two types of volume. The one that we were already have discussion on this. One is the Amazon EBS, that is a persistent storage system. Whatever the data you will write, it will always return into your EBS volume. This is a permanent storage of your data. Whereas the Amazon EC2 instance store is a temporary storage of your data, which is non-persistent storage system. Whatever the if your server restarts or if you stop the server, whatever the data that you have written into this will be completely lost. So this is non-persistent storage system and the EBS is our persistent storage system. So with this persistent storage system, volume persists independent of Amazon EC2. Volume termination protection from accidental deletion of your EC2 instance. Just like your EC2 instance, you have termination protection. The same termination protection you can apply on the EBS volume. So that uh, any by mistakely or any way, uh, any person cannot delete this EBS volume directly. Select storage and compute based on your workload. There are different kinds of, uh, you know, uh, storage types available. Already we have seen certain general purpose IOPS in while creation of our EC2 instance, but we didn't went through into detail. So uh, in this session, we will go into detail what are the different types available and what are the purpose. In the future that you get here is, you can detach and attach between instances within the same memory zone, which means if you have two or multiple EC2 instance in the same ability zone, you can detach and attach that EC2 uh, EBS volume and attach it to another instance, just like your pen drive. You have two pen, you have two systems in your home. You are detaching, you are attaching one pen drive in one of the system, then you detach and attach it to another system. The same works here, but the condition is it needs to be in the same ability zone. The another condition here is. When you have one EC2 instance which is connected to one EBS volume, this communication will happen only once. That is, one EBS volume can attach to one EC2 instance at a single time, point of time. If you want to attach this EBS volume to another EC2 machine, then you need to first detach this volume and then attach it to another EC2 machine. At the same time, one EBS volume cannot be attached to multiple EC2 instances. Please note it down. One EBS volume cannot be attached to multiple EC2 instances at the same time. But you can detach from one EC2 instance and then attach it to another EC2 instance. At the same just time. Like sorry? No, just like databases. Yes, yes. And secondly, one EC2 instance can have multiple EBS volumes. One EC2 instance can have multiple EBS volume. Uh, depending on the number of configuration, whatever you set, 8 GB, 10 GB, 100 GB, thousands of GB, whatever you have, you can set. One EC2 instance can have multiple volumes, but one volume cannot be associated to multiple EC2 instances at the same time. What you need to do in that case, you need to detach from first EC2 instance and then attach it to another EC2 instance. All right. Now, okay. EBS volumes are physical storage of volume. Just like your SSD volume in your computer, in your hard uh, laptop, whatever the SSD volume you have. Similarly, AWS EBS offers you the same SSD and HDD volume. This is a physical storage of your data. That is, it's not a cloud storage, it's not a network storage, it's a physical storage. So you need to make sure that your data, your EBS volume and your EC2 instance both are in the same ability zone, not in the same region but in the same ability zone. In Mumbai, we have three ability zones. So the EC2 instance which is residing in ability zone 1A, the EBS volume need to be a part of the same ability zone 1A. Then only you will be able to connect to this different EC2 machines. All right. So every volume will have a different drive letter. Sorry, every volume will have a different drive letter. Let's say like I have a yes. I have a Windows one instance. 
I add one volume today, it's a D drive. So tomorrow I add another volume, it'll be E drive, something like that? Yes. Okay. And you have options in the Windows server. You can migrate all these different volumes, 10 GB, 10 GB, 10 GB. You can add three volumes and then you can add all these volumes in your Windows machine. That is a common 30 GB of storage for a volume C, for a volume D. Yeah. Right, right, right. Great yeah. options you have in the Windows system by default. All right. So point here that you need to always remember when these two machines can have multiple volumes. One volume cannot be associated to multiple EC2 instances at the same time. It must be associated to a single EC2 instance only. The third best practice says that you should always grow horizontally. That is, if you today if your requirement is 10 GB only, and tomorrow if you require another 10 GB, so you should not upgrade the existing EVS volume to 20 GB. You should create one more 10 GB of volume and attach it. Reason behind because AWS gives you future to easily upgrade the existing volume to higher version from 10 GB to 20 GB, from 100 GB to 200 GB, whatever the uh, upgradation you want to do, you can do it easily. But once this volume is upgraded to higher version, you cannot downgrade it. From 20 GB, you cannot go back to the 100 GB. So for example, if you are running a business that requires a 100 GB of storage today, tomorrow your business is running high so you might require more gbs of storage so you add 100 gb inside that so 100 becomes 200 now in case in future day after tomorrow or somewhere after six months if you don't require that 200 gb of data your business is not working now you are not required this 200 gb of data so in that case you cannot downgrade the data here you cannot downgrade the size here so you need to pay extra every single time so in that case you should grow horizontally that is, you can attach multiple volumes here, 100 GB plus 100 GB plus 100 GB. In case if you don't require the another 100 GB, you can just delete that EVS volume. Take a snapshot of the data and just terminate the service. That's it. So in this way, you should always grow horizontally again. It's one of the AWS best practices. Okay, so uh, I understand like uh, if you have a um, 100, 100 gig volume, I mean 100 gig EBS today. If yeah. you don't have, if you don't need enough thing, you cannot say, hey, you know what? It's like to take 50 gig away. We cannot do that. No, you cannot do that. You cannot uh, decrease right. the size of an EBS volume. You right. So, the but size. the thing is, but if I have 50 gig, 50 gig, 50 gig, I can get rid of that 50 gig. Right. Okay. Got it. Because you have multiple volumes, you can terminate any of this volume if you don't require. Yeah, okay. All right, so. So now you have one EC2 instance which is connected to different EVS volumes. Now, as we have already discussed this as a part of the first EC2 section, that one you can consider as a boot volume and other two can be considered the data volume. That is one will be your part of your AMI, which will contain all the operating system details, the server that you want to install and the basic data. And what are the actual data that you are implementing uh, with respect to your application, which is will be residing in another volumes of data. So you have complete flexibility in case this data volume requires more size, you can add, you can subtract anything and it will not affect to your boot machine. At the same time, for the replication purpose, for the migration purpose, again, it will be very beneficial to have a separate boot volumes and the data volume. For the boot volume, you can go to 8 GB, 10 GB, 12 GB, whatever the, what de depends on what kind of application you are running and what kind of servers and all the things. Based on that, you can select this volume size and you can have a boot system separate. For the data part, you can have separate data so that you, it will not conflict or it will not affect to your system in case if you turn it to any of this EBS volume. Now what you need to make sure that your EC2 machine and your EBS volume are in the same availability zone. All right. <laughs> now, <coughs> there are different kinds okay, of... Uh, uh, Lalit, one question. Yes. So, 
if my EC2 is attached to multiple EBS volumes, right? Let's say if I take an image of it under snapshot, am I going to have only one snapshot or for each EBS volume, am I going to have multiple snapshots? All right. So for example, one EC2 instance have three EBS volumes. EBS. Let's say yeah. three EBS volume. Yeah. So you have complete control on which snapshot you want to take EBS volume one, EBS volume two, EBS volume three. That is complete. Okay. So if I take an image of it, like the default image, right? Okay. So if you take EMI of this EC2 machine, <coughs> associated to this EBS volume only, the boot volume. This will include all the data which is associated with this boot volume. It will not contain oh. the data of your EBS volume, which is a part of a data, the external storage that you have attached. It will only I'll have to take separate system. snapshots. Yes. Oh, got it. Yeah, so so sorry, I wanted to add something to what he had. The the separate volume and the snapshot, the, the idea of a snapshot is mostly when you want to do something like maybe a fast system extension, or you see that one of the EBS volume is running out of disk space and you want to extend it, you can do a snapshot. So that's kind of individual on each of the EBS volumes. Yes. So yeah. exactly if you want to copy the data from one EC2 machine to another machine, let's say the EBS volume, the second EBS volume, the data which is residing in this EBS volume, you want to attach the same data to another EC2 machine. So in that case, you can just take a snapshot of this particular EMI ID. Sorry, this particular EBS volume. So guys, I'm audible. You are audible, yes. Yeah, yeah. Chitranjan, I think this is uh, something error, network error from your side. You are not getting my audio. So, Lalit, in this scenario, let's say if I take, uh, if I want to replicate this uh, setup to <laughs> another uh, data zone, let's say availability zone. Right. Let's say I have to take image, let's say of this EC2 instance. That's one step. Second step is take uh, EBS volume uh, data snapshot. And again, another snapshot of the another data volume. Right. It's a three-step process, right? Right. Okay. Okay. So now that yes, uh, we, yeah. we we created an image or or in a, a North Virginia availability zone, right. but uh, you mentioned yesterday that the key pair are the regions. <laughs> right. So. How are we going to access that uh, particular AMI once we start the launch an EC2 instance? Okay. So again, when we create an EC2 machine, we select an AMI. That AMI just only have the information about your operating system and the data which is residing, the applications and everything. It will not contain the description or the configuration that you have set for your EC2 machine. Now the key here applies on the EC2 machine level. So you have complete control to change the key pair, to create a new key pair, or to upload your own existing key pair. You can change the key pair when uh, creation of new EC2 machine anytime. Okay. AMI that we okay. have created, the AMI that we have copied in the North Virginia, if I select that AMI and create a launch machine, then it will ask me again to select another key pair. So that key pair, I can create a new key pair, or I can create a, uh, I can choose the existing key pair for my North Virginia. This key pair belongs to EC2 machine. It doesn't belong to an AMI. All right. Makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah. Last question though on 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 AMI image. So yesterday I think I asked that question when you first mentioned this topic on the introduction. So my question is when you use an AMI. I know we are not yet on auto scaling. Maybe I understand better when we get to auto scaling, but I just want to throw it out there now. So um, when you have an AMI image and you want to set up maybe auto scaling, right? How much how much up to date is an AMI image based on the point in time data that is running on a server that needs to replicate or create another instance to support an active uh, maybe a, a growing traffic. So I mean, so how 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 up to date is an AMI image to support or to or to or to roll out another instance and spread traffic into it? So if I get your question correctly, your question is like 
you have created an AMI if you are putting this AMI for an auto scaling mode so how are you having the updated data in that AMI or right. how much yeah basically an AMI is nothing but a snapshot of your existing data the moment you have that you have taken a snapshot it will include all the data till then for example at 8 a.m. if you have taken a snapshot at, at 9 a.m. if you are creating a auto scaling group then this auto scaling EC2 machine will have a data which is in your EC2 machine till 8 a.m. it will not have the dynamic data that is uh, it will not synchronously update the data to your snapshot it's just a snapshot of your existing data whatever you have at 8 p.m. till then whatever the data you had it will create a copy of that only so the auto scaling is automatic but taking the snapshot is manual right so whenever you know whatever the time you take a snapshot only that's what the data, is the auto scale. yeah only the data till by that time whatever you had in your ec2 machine that data will be only copied to your snapshot it's not like a synchronous replication of your data if it is manual then what happens in the night when you're running a critical business and nobody's there to take the snapshot or, or to take an EMI. So when you when you when you when you maybe your your resources need to expand to support an incoming traffic of something that is running, maybe a Netflix or maybe Hulu's. Okay. There's a high demand for Hulu's on the weekend. Right. So what so, happens basically in production account, how companies use this AMI in the auto scaling mode is whenever a new EC2 machine comes up, it has an AMI which includes all the basic information required to create a system like the operating system the platform which a uh, system is working on python node.js whatever it is it has all the basic information only to create a server for us now once the server is ready you need to run a pipeline from where your data is available the code is available for, which is stored in s3 or github or anywhere where you have stored this data where you have our uh, application is running, you need to run that pipeline automatically, and that will push this data to your EC2 machine. This is okay. continuous okay. and continuous deployment. Okay, yeah, I get it. I get it. So, so, so the data source is the same. Only the new machine is created, and it's tapped from the data source that is up to date. Yeah, I get it. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. whatever the new packages, whatever the new updates that you are doing on your system that will again happen where your data is residing maybe it's a github mm -hmm. maybe it's a big bucket or st wherever you are storing this data the data is actually stored on these third-party tools and you run a pipeline once this new machine comes up it will throw uh, it will invoke this pipeline this pipeline will be generated and it will uh, use the data wherever it is github big bucket where your data is residing it will use this data and upload it to your ec2 machine cool thank you yeah now let's talk about the ebs volume types there is there are two types of ebs volume type one is sst and one is sdt and this is a very basic we all know that sdt sst is only volume type that we can use to boot our machines in our laptop in our computer whatever the storage that we have 500 gb or one terabyte if that machine is an internal hard disk type then this is called as sst and whatever the external drive that we attach is a part of a SDT. So again, we have the same here, SSD and HDD. SSD can be used to boot your EC2 machine. HDD only can be used to save your data, to store your data. Now, in both the types, we have two different types available. First is general purpose SSD, and second is the provision IOPS SSD. And in HDD, we have throughput optimized SDD, and second is the core SSD. Apart from these four different types of storage system, we have another one called as magnetic tapes. Like in general, we have a magnetic storage type, the same we have in AWS. Magnetic types of volumes are very cheap, but uh, they are having a very low performance also. If they are giving you a cheap rate, uh, the cost of the storage volume is very cheap, but at the same time, it has a very low performance. So it's recommended for your normal, normal workload you should always go with the general purpose SSD. So what exactly this kinds of different SSD volumes are? General purpose SSD, it uh, gives you balance for price and performance for the variety of workload. 
like for most players for system boot modules virtual desktop low latency interactive applications developer interaction for all these purposes you can go with general purpose ssd a single size of a volume can be from 1 gigabyte to 16 terabyte the minimum and the maximum capacity that you can uh, have for your general purpose ssd is from 1 gb to maximum of 16 terabyte seeing for the provision iops now provision iops is mostly used when you are having a database running in that system in that database in that eps one that is you are interacting continuously for a minor uh, you know upload and download for the minor syncing of your data when you are having require high performance of data high input output operation at that time you can go with the provision iops it support critical business application that requires sustain iops performance input output performance when you require high at that time you can go with the provision iops and volume size start from 4 gigabyte to 16 terabyte this is the minimum and the maximum capacity for a single ebs volume now both of this ssd volume can be used to create your ec2 machine can be used to boot your ec2 volumes the second two different types of volumes are hdd that is throughput optimized and core hdd throughput optimized it's a low cost hdd volume designed for frequently accessed data but the difference between throughput optimized and the core hdd is throughput is used for frequently accessed data while the core hdd is used for infrequently accessed data throughput optimized can be used for streaming of your workload like if you are having a certain video files which you want to uh, stream on your application you can go with the throughput optimized for big data data we are hosting log processing batch processing multitasking you can go with this throughput optimized hdd important point about the hard disk type types of volumes you cannot use this volumes to boot your machines the minimum size starts from 50 uh, 500 gb maximum up to 16 terabytes then we have core hdd the core hdd again designed for less frequent use that is infrequent access data you can store uh, the data which is very infrequently accessed that you require once in a week once once in a week twice in a week whatever the uh, scenario you have if you are having a less frequently accessed data then you can go with the core hdd for backing up your data for uh, you know uh, taking the snapshot of your data wherever you require a low storage uh, cost you can go with core hdd these are the four different kinds of hdd volumes now the best part of the ebs volume is a snapshot this technology is not yet available to any other cloud computing platform or not even in the on premise infrastructure this is called as first point in time recovery that is you can create a snapshot and you can recover your data at any point of time you require second the best feature of the snapshots of a ebs volume that's offered you by the amazon is incremental backup now what is incremental backup anyone has idea what is incremental backup yes because when you first do a backup you know the backup the entire data the incremental backups are only the delta changes right only the data that are changing in your existing data that will only affect for example let's take a scenario open you have a 10 gb of ebs volume you click on action and create a snapshot so snapshot a was created here with a 10 gb of volume now ebs volume snapshot are always stored on s3 snapshots are always stored on s3 but if you visit to s3 and if you and if you are looking for your ebs snapshot you won't find there because it is hidden to your aws management console you can find your snapshot in the ec2 section itself in the snapshot section itself only the data which is we have taken snapshot will be stored on the s3 storage system so once you take the scenario here scenario one see that you have time to take volume then you take the snapshot A lot of dissonance there. Yeah. So scenario one says you have a 10 GB of volume. You have taken a snapshot, and the snapshot 10 GB of data has been created. Let's say to this 10 GB of volume, now you have updated 2 GB of data. 
rest of your HGB of data is still there, which is common from the snapshot A. Only the 2 GB of data has been updated from the existing data. So out of the 10 GB of data, only the 2 GB of data has been updated. Now, if you take a snapshot of this volume, snapshot B will be created. Inside the snapshot B, it will take a 8 GB of reference data. The data is still available in the snapshot A. It will just only refer this data from the snapshot A to the snapshot B and it will update the, ex the updated data 2 GB of data to the snapshot B. So technically for the snapshot A you are paying for the 10 GB of storage. For the snapshot B you are only paying 2 GB of your volume. Instead of paying for 20 GB, 10 GB plus 10 GB for the two different snapshot, here you are paying only for 12 GB of storage. 10 plus 2. Let's take one more scenario. You have added, you have uh, modified the 10 GB of volume to 12 GB of volume. That is your additional 2 GB of volume of data. So inside your 8 GB plus 2 GB of modified data, you have now additional 2 GB of data. 10 plus 2, 12 GB of data. All right. You have uh, modified the existing EBS volume to, from 10 to 12 GB. Now, if you take a snapshot, snapshot C will be created and inside the snapshot C it will refer the 8 GB of reference data from the snapshot A. It will update the snapshot B and it will have the 2 GB of snapshot B from the uh, it will have the reference data from the snapshot B and whatever the snapshot C it will have again 2 GB of additional data that you have included in your EBS one. So technically Instead of paying for 10 plus 10 plus 10, you are here paying only for 14 GB of data. All right. Now the question comes, what if I delete a snapshot A? Because snapshot A is dependent on the snapshot B and snapshot C. What if I delete the snapshot A? What will happen? Practically, the data should uh, lose. It should lose the data. Uh, if, if you delete, yeah. If you delete snapshot A, I think the snapshot C and B will rebuild it because this is just like a raid system. Exactly, this is just like a raid system. So, if you delete the snapshot A, what will happen? This 8 GB of the reference data, which is in uh, passed to the snapshot B, will be sent to the snapshot B. The, all the AGP of content will be passed to the snapshot B and then A will be deleted. So now snapshot B will have 10 GB of your data, 8 GB of your old data, 2 GB of new data and this all the data will be referred to the snapshot C. So again you are, you are paying only for the 12 GB of data. Yeah, this is more like a data dedupe. Right. Okay, got it, yeah. Yeah, I, I have another way to to say it, which is mostly on um, on a schedule backup. If you schedule a backup job that runs twice daily, when it runs maybe in the morning and in the and in the afternoon or in the evening, what happens is the backup data what what it backs up in the morning and what it backs up in the evening is gonna just be what has been added that was not previously backed up in the morning. Correct. So yeah, that's only delta changes. Yes. Yes. It's only the data changes. The changes that has made between first backup and the second backup, it will have only yeah. change backup only. Right. That's the incremental. Now, this kind of storage system will help you to save your cost. Instead of paying for 30 GB of gigs, you pay only for 14 GB, not even half of it, less than half. And creation of the snapshot is again absolutely free. You don't get charged for creation of the snapshot. You only get charged for the amount of storage that you take. Correct? Yeah, service is free, but storage is money. Yeah. Storage you need to pay. Yeah. So this is incremental backshop. All right for everyone. Okay. And then the EBS, like EBS storage is uh, HDD, I guess, correct? It's not an SSD. This is the SSD. EBS volumes are SSD. Or you can have any okay. SSD or HDD. It can be any. Okay. Okay. This is a part of a snapshot. Whatever the snapshot features you have on AWS, this is a part of it. It applies to both SSD and HDD. Uh, right now, the EBS volume that we have, 
I, I think it's a vertical scaling, right? Not horizontal scaling. Yeah, this eight plus two, uh, that is ten plus two. This is called vertical scaling. All right. All right. Yeah, that's correct. Thank you. Now, exit of your snapshot. So snapshot, these are the four important points. That is snapshot of encrypted volumes are automatically encrypted. So if your snapshot is encrypted, then what if the volumes that you will create out of this snapshot will be automatically encrypted. Volumes that are encrypted for an encrypted snapshot, that is the volume that are created from the encrypted snapshot are again automatically created, uh, encrypted. I think the both are same. No, the, the first uh, describes about the snapshot, second describes about the volume. Third is, when you copy an unencrypted snapshot that you own, you can encrypt it during the copy process. So if you want to encrypt the data from an unencrypted snapshot to the encrypted data, then you can do via copying the process. The same way that you copy from one region to another region, the AMI ID, the AMI that we have seen, how to copy from one region to another region. In the same way, you can copy in the same region and while copying this process, you can encrypt this data. And when you have this encrypted snapshot already that you own, you can re-encrypt your data with the again copy process. So you can, if you want to re-encrypt twice, if you want to uh, encrypt twice, then you can do this process again, the copy process. So let's see now the demo of EPS volume. All right, so I have two is two machines one in both are in the AP South 1A. Okay, this is very important to understand AP South 1A. Now to create a volume, just go to the volume section. And here you have again the 88 GB of volume. In case if you want to expand the existing volume to a higher version, what you can do is click on action and modify the existing volume. <laughs> you can say 10 GB. 12 GB, whatever the amount of GB you want. The condition is minimum 1 GB, maximum 16 terabyte. But this is a 8 GB of volume, so I cannot say 7 GB here. This gives me error message that the size of the volume can be only increased, not decreased. So you must only increase the size of the volume that is called as a vertical scaling. Now, in case if you want to attach multiple volumes here, just click on create volume. The amount of GPC one, let's go with the 10 GP of volume. From here, you can select the different kinds of SST volumes here, HTT volumes here, anything. <coughs> let's go again with the general purpose. In particular, ability zone, which one you want to create. Now, both of our easy instances are in AP South 1A. So, I will go again with this. If you want to copy the data from any snapshot, you can search the snapshot here. You can provide the snapshot ID here. And whatever the data which is present in your EPS volume snapshot, that data will be copied in this part. But as of now, we don't have anything. Just give a tag name. Yeah. And hit on create volume. So you have two GPs of volume and the one that we have just created the 10 GP of extra volume. All right, now to associate this to uh, one of the easy transfers, what you need to do, you need to wait for till the status becomes available. Once this is available, it means it can be attached to any easy transfers. If it is already attached to any easy transfers, it will mark as in use. So wait for it, the status becomes available, and then click on action and attach volume. And from here, you can select your easy transfers. Now again, Giving a tag tags to your EC2 instance will help you to select the exact EC2 instance that you want to attach and detach whatever the actions you want to perform. If you do not provide this tags here, you won't be able to find or identify via this instance ID. Again, you need to go to the instance type, uh, instances section, you need to copy the instance ID and provide it here. So it's always a good practice to provide the tags here. So let's do one thing, let's attach to the Linux instance one, all right, and then we attach it here. 
So now the status becomes in use, which has been attached. Let's go to instance settings. If I click on Linux instance one, if I just scroll, now I have two devices of here. They have XVDA and the second is STF. There are two locations available. Whereas for the Linux instance two, I have only one. So it has attached to two EC2 machines. Let me just exit from the system from the system two. And I'm currently in the system Linux EC2 machine one, 18.239. That is 18.239. Alright, so I'm in my Linux machine one. Now to check whether your EBS volume is successfully attached to your EC2 instance or not, the command is list block blk ls blk to check whether the machines whether your number of EBS volumes is attached or not. Hit enter and it will throw you all the description. That is 8 GB of boot volume, XVDA1. And the second is SVDF, which is 10 GB of data. But you can see here, this data is not mounted. The 8 GB of data is mounted, but the 10 GB of data is not mounted. So technically, you cannot use this 10 GB of data. So to, you need to first mount this directory. So what we'll do, we'll create a file system first. Because this is a completely new directory, this is completely new volume. We need to format this volume. So what we'll do? We make a file system. Make file system mkfs hyphen t. Then different types of uh, formats you have for a Linux machine. It's ext4 for a Windows machine. It's a uh, fat32, fat16. You can go or ntfs system for Mac. It's Mac OS, Mac extended OS. Different kinds of volumes you have. Different kinds of formats here. So you can, so, Lanit, can I do these uh, tasks from uh, AWS site itself? No, you cannot. Or I have to go. You need to go to. A so if it is a Windows machine, how can I do that? Yes, you can do this. Uh, just log into the Windows machine and the configuration. You can uh, create one EBS. So remotely log into that machine and uh, okay. Yeah, you need to log into that machine and you have this EBS oh. machine available that you can format. Oh, got it. Yeah. Then ext4. And then you need to describe that which format, which drive you want to format. So in our case, it's df slash svdf. This is the one that we need to format. So you need to provide this location here, slash df slash svdf. So we need to format this svdf format, hit enter. Okay, our file system has been formatted. Now what we need to do is to mount our directory, to mount our EBS volume, we need to create a directory. So the second command is mkdir main directory and you can give any name here. Let's say instance. Okay, so make, I have created one directory instance. Now I want to ma uh, move this directory, mount this directory to the new EC2 machine. The command is mount slash df slash xvdf. This is directed that I want to mount where I want to mount to my instance folder. Hit enter. If I check now lsblk, so to this instance directory, now it is mounted to my xvdf. So, in case now if you want to go to this directory into this 10 GP of data and if you want to write any data. You need to just change the directory to instance and you are in 10 GB of your storage. Now currently our data is completely empty. We do not have any data here. So let's create one file. We are test.txt let's say and we add some random data. I see. Now if I say instance, I have one test.txt file in my 10 GB of data. Correct? Any question, any doubt how to uh, mount this directory, how to make this uh, format this directory? Anything? For those who are not aware of this linear system, for them it will be a little heavy, but I will create a document which will share with you so that it will be useful for you.
So Lalit, uh, we can use this in Windows uh, while going to the disk movie for the same no, stuff we are doing here. It's a separate process. Uh, you will find easily on the AWS uh, in the Windows console, in the my doc uh, computer section, where you can easily format this drive and use it. Because we have graphicals there, so you can do it directly. So, uh, see, uh, you are attaching an additional EBS volume and you're mounting it to this particular uh, running instance. That's right. what you're doing here, right? Right. But in case this EBS volume already contains some data. Right. Then uh, let's do it. How do we do that without format? Right. So now tell me, this is my 10 GB of data. This is my 10 GB of EBS volume, which has certain data. This is your question. Now this is the 10 GB of data, which has certain data. If you want to attach yeah. 10 GB of data to another instance, so how will you do this? So of course, at that time, yeah, you have to format this drive, definitely. So our, um, our command MKFS will not work here. MKFS will only work when you want to create a new directory, when you want to create a new format, or uh, the first time only, you need to use this command MKFS. For the rest of the time, when you want to detach and attach to another instances, you will not use this command. So in that case, what will you do is, let's say in my EC2 instance one currently I'm in, in that case, I have 10 GB of additional volume in that I have a certain data. So what I will do, I will unmount this directory here and then I will attach it to another EC2 machine. So that whatever the questions you had, if you are, if there is already data available and if you want to attach that data to another EC2 instance, then how we will perform that. First thing okay. that you need to do is you need to remove or you need to come out of this instance that is out of this um, what do you say the mounting directory. All right, so I currently I'm in home directory, right? So the command so is you need, yeah. so you need to unmount it first. Okay. Yeah. So I pass here the command you mount. Just like our pen drive, uh, whenever we remove the pen drive, there is the op option to eject the volume, right? So similarly, we need to unmount this directory. The command is unmount u mount hyphen d and the name of the directory. That's here slash sdl. And if I do lsblk again to check, then the mounting directory has been successfully removed. Okay, but still it has the 10 GB of data. Still, this is a part of my EC2 instance one. So in that case, what I need to do, just go to the AWS console, go into the volume section again, select the particular volume, action, detach this volume. Now this will take few seconds to make the system status again available. So we can't directly detach it, right? We have to unmount and then only detach. Like if you directly detach this volume, if any application is writing any data in that volume, that data will be lost. Okay. Just similar, you have one laptop and you have attached one pen drive and you are copying certain data in that pen drive and the middle of the action you have removed the pen drive. So in that part, whatever the data you are writing in that pen drive will be lost, definitely. The same works here. So definitely it's the best practice you should unmount the directory and then you can detach this part. When it is in available state again, you can click on action, attach this volume and this time I will attach it to Linux instance 2. Attach. Right. So now let me just connect to my another machine. I have so this is the same process for the um, uh, Windows 2 I guess, correct? Uh, for Windows, it's a different process. Actually. I think for Windows, it's even much easier because you go, I think, yeah. into uh, manager or something, and then you just run some. It, it's much easier on Windows, from my experience. Yeah, it's, it's yeah much... but how do you detach a drive on a, on a Windows? I mean, there's no mount or unmount there. Don't worry, guys. I, I will show you in Windows also. Okay. 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 So I'm having a new terminal and I'm connecting to my Linux machine 2. Okay, so this is 26.93, which is my second machine. And if I do LSPLK, I have this 10 GPU volume attached. 
but to my first EC2 machine, if I do LSVLK now, I don't have the 10 GB. It's only showing me 8 GB of data, which is attached to the 10 GB. So this 10 GB of volume will have one text.txt file, which is the data in my system, right? So now, what I will do is I will create one directory here once again. Let's say this time any name you can give. Uh, test. And now I will mount this directory to my machine. That is slash tape slash svdr slash test. <coughs> ELK. Now this test ID has been successfully mounted to my machine. So if I go to this test machine, test folder, I must have that text.txt file. And here it is. Which says random data. So the same file, the same data, which has been used between two different EC2 machine. Now only one question. Again, for copying this machine or copying this data or detaching and attaching to another volume, do you re really require to format the directory to create to pass the command mkfs? Is it required? Required no. only when only when you are adding a new disk, like when you want to add a new disk space when you've added a new volume, but. I don't think when you when you copy and attach a volume, you don't you don't need to do an MKFS. Exactly, you don't need to do it again. If you do it again, you will lose your data because this will format your drive. Okay, this is the first part that you need to always remember. You should not do this part. Uh, you should not uh, format this directory. Uh, you should not pass this command second time for making MKFS. In case if you want to format the drive, if you want to uh, you know clear all the data, in that case only you should do MKFS. Now second thing, this file system that we have created, it only works for the Linux machine. Because the ext4, the system that we have created, it works only for Linux machine. If you want to use the same data for the Windows machine, it won't be useful. The same directory, the same volume, you cannot attach to your Windows machine. It won't recognize the machine, it won't recognize the EBS volume. Even if it recognizes, if you try to open the directory, then it will first ask you to format the directory. And formatting the directory, which means you completely lose your data. This is a basic thing that you can even try at your home, having a one Linux machine, having a Windows machine. You Format some directory in the Linux machine, you enter some turn data and then you copy this pen drive and apply it to the Windows machine. You will not be this uh, pen drive will not be recognizable in the Windows machine. If you want to have common directory, common system, you have two options. Either you can go with a FAT32 kind of uh, operating uh, format system. FAT32, FAT16 is recognizable by all the operating system or you can go with MS Talks. MX Talk is also recognizable by all the different operating system. Or if you don't want to this, if you want to, if you don't want to do, do this all this part, the best case is go with the EFS system. So what is EFS? Lalit, could we show that the command that we use for review mount and mounting? Uh, mounting and remounting. Yeah. Okay. Just give me a second. Okay. So next part is a EFS system. So what exactly EFS is? It is called as NTFS system. That is network based file system. Whatever the data that you will upload to this NTFS system, you can replicate this data to multiple EC2 machines. For example, you have five EC2 instances. And to this five EC2 instances, you will have a common directory and this data will persist on the network. It doesn't belong to any block storage, it doesn't belong to an EBS or S3 or anything. It belongs to a network. The data will be stored on the network that can be used 
to uh, that can be used in all the different operating system within the same ability zone and beyond the ability zone within the same region this EPS volume has a restriction that a single EPS volume can only be used into a single ability zone in case if you want to replicate the data in another ability zone you need to create a snapshot or replicate the data into another ability zone and then you can make a use of it but EFS system is a common dietary system that it can create or you can use this network file system to multiple EC2 instances in multiple location multiple uh, ability zone within the same region all right so this is what we will see now uh, it's already time we'll see the EFS system tomorrow and how to connect to a, uh, you know EBS volume to a Windows machine how to configure and everything we'll see that part tomorrow yeah I think we have to go over this NTFS tomorrow again yeah this is a, again uh, it will take a 30 minutes more to perform so we'll do it tomorrow so one of you have it tomorrow or uh, sorry Lalit do we have it tomorrow yeah EFS system will do it tomorrow Wait, wait, tomorrow oh. you meaning oh, sorry, you Monday? Mean, tomorrow means uh, on Tuesday, Indian time Tuesday. Tuesday, Indian time. Okay, yeah. all right. Yeah, thank you. Uh, all right, cool. It should be on 16th of July, Indian time. And for you, it's 15th of July. Okay, cool. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Well, it, uh, um, I have one question yeah, from yesterday's question regarding the mounting and right? So, what do you want me to do? So I'm gonna hang up, okay? Okay, all right. Bye. If you have Ramesh, uh, any questions, Ramesh, one minute. Uh, I have a question. I think uh, you should also be there too. Sorry, sorry. Okay, go ahead. Ask. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm going to ask. It's, it's from the last class, actually. Yeah, yeah. If you have any questions, please stay here. Otherwise, we will see it uh, uh, next week. Next week, the rest of the section. All right. Cool. So, Thank you. All right, thank you. I wanted to ask you, like, uh, yeah, last night I was trying to create one instance, and uh, and at that point of time, I created an instance without a public IP address. Okay. One Linux instance was there, so I was able to access that from uh, the Windows machine, but when I was running uh, any sudo or yum command, like yum update, I was not able to do that. It was not picking up the libraries. Or dependencies. So, well, you mean to say you have one Linux machine and one Windows machine, one Linux instance and yeah. instance. And from this Windows mm -hmm. instance, you were able to connect to the Linux instance, correct? Yeah. So, okay, that is possible within the same VPC. That is possible, just like we did from one Linux machine to another machine. That is possible, but you will be not able to connect to this machine because it doesn't have a public IP and internet requires a public IP for interaction with your instance for example in your laptop you have connected to the LAN cable and that LAN cable is connected to another computer that is between two computers you have a LAN cable and communication so you can pass this data from one system to another system via this LAN cable but anyone sitting on the internet cannot be connected to your machine because you do not have the public IP, right? And that's the reason mm -hmm. you were not able to download any package, any libraries files in that EC2 machine. You must have the public IP and an internet connection in that system. All right, so uh, to uh, achieve this target, we will be needing uh, load balancers. Yes, of course. So what will the architecture looks like you are in your public subnet uh, this is a part of a, a, sub, a public subnet and private subnet in the inside of vpc you expose mm -hmm. everything which is required to be on public on the elb on the load balancer and you make your ec2 machines private so that mm -hmm. anyone on the internet cannot recognize or cannot uh, you know access to your data which is residing in your ec2 machine Nobody on the internet can connect to your EC2 machine. But your EC2 machine will be able to take a request and send a response via this load balancer. Because load balancer is, we have given the permission to the load balancer. It can send us request and take a back the response 
and ELB is placed to the internet to the public subnet. So whenever you pass the data to the domain, that is your domain is associated with one load balancer, let's say you have example.com. Whenever you hit to the example.com, this example.com will divert the traffic to the ELB, which is on the front end, which is on internet side. So this ELB will request privately to your EC2 instance to get the data. So it will take the data from the EC2 machine. Whatever the response is coming, it will show back to the browser. So your HT port, ET port and HTTP port, whatever the 443 and 84 you have, you will expose this port on the ELB side and you will keep your data private in the EC2 instance. So this is the best case uh, scenario, which is uh, how uh, Solution RK designed their infrastructure, keeping all your data, all your EC2 instance in the private mode and then expose only the ELB. So uh, in this scenario, you mentioned example.com. Right, any domain. Any domain. Uh, how uh, do we achieve this? Like I was, if we are not able to put up the exchange, uh, like uh, there's an uh, web application web front is hosted on an uh, Linux one instance, right? And uh, it's not connected to the internet. It's not connecting, it's not, does not have a public IP address. And we had this question yesterday also. Uh, how do we achieve that? How do we achieve uh, to access those websites, uh, the content that's being hosted on these uh, particular web servers to the external traffic? Because internal communication between AWS within your VPC is happens over your private IP. Whatever the traffic that ELB is getting and whatever the traffic it is sending to the EC2 instance, this communication is happening on the EC2 instance private IP, not the public IP. Mm -hmm. So we expose our ELB to the internet and we keep our EC2 instance private. That's the reason okay. we have a secure infrastructure. So let's say example.com uh, and, and we have uh, created a route, of, of route 53 uh, route in uh, uh, the environment and it's it will be pointing to the EBS, right? Uh, depends on scenario. Like you can see here in this example yesterday, these are the mm -hmm. user clicked to your route 53. This is your domain, right? anything dot com dot in whatever you have. So whenever this hit in this route 53, you said where this traffic needs to be routed. So in that case, we are heading to the application load balancer, which is residing in the public subnet. This is green, which means this is a public subnet, which is exposed to the internet, right? And yes. this communication, uh, whatever the request uh, this application load balancer get, it is diverted to the private subnet residing in two ability zone, giving you high ability. Mm -hmm. So these are in the private subnet. These are this uh, subnets and this sequences do not have internet connection. So what is the request are coming? It happens. It comes on the load balancer. Load balancer is a front end to which is exposed on the internet to serve to take the request and to serve the request. So this is the secret infrastructure on the AWS cloud based on the solution of best practices and well architecture framework. Okay, so we will be covering this part in the course. Yes, yes, yes. Once we see the VPC, you will have a very broad set of knowledge about how to design this infrastructure. What is public IP? What is private IP? How to use this? Okay, so so far, if we are trying to put a public and private combination like I did yesterday, I will only be able to access my services. Uh, yes, because which are not communication well, happening between two different private IPs. You are connecting via private IP. That's why you were able to connect. But at the same time, even if you have an internet connection, if it is in the public subnet, still you were not able to download any package because your instance do not have any public IP. And if you know the OSI model, if you know how the communication happens between a source to the destination and how this communication happens between the data transmission between source to destination, it always requires a public IP. For example, if I am the sender, you are a receiver. So to whom I will send the data? I need to know your public IP. So mm -hmm. you are accessible to your internet IP. And so I, you, you must be uh, globally available on the internet. 
so that I can share my data with you. If you do not have the public IP, how can I send the data to you? If I am the sender, you are the receiver, how I can send the data? Because private IP is for the internal purpose only. Yeah, understood. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Lalit. Thank you. Any other question, any doubt? So basically, once we cover this VP section, you will have a very broad set of information like VPC cover half of our AWS course. This is a very huge topic. And make sure once you are done with this uh, lab session, you terminate every Linux machine and all the EBS volumes and etc. If you have copied this EMI to another volumes, everything you do in another region. Otherwise, you will get charged for that. I have a question. So many topics in this, uh, I mean, so many things here are in, uh, related with Linux, and uh, I really very have less knowledge on the Linux. I was wondering if we get any, you know, content on the Linux, what has to be done. If, uh, I mean, after the class, I was planning to practice all these sessions yesterday and today as well. So, so yeah. uh, just give me one yeah. day. I will give you a document that will have a basic information about the operating system, basic commands of the operating system. I, I mean to say that at least at least data till date. I, I want the data till today. What we can practice for tomorrow? We we have uh, two days of huge time tomorrow and after tomorrow. So that's the reason I was asking if I can get some data on to what to practice, what not to practice. Uh, that's why. That's actually just provide you today now. I'll try my best. If, uh, if I get completed, then I will pull you an email uh, with all the details. Any links or anything from where I can learn? Um, you can just use Google. Button. Um. Now, whatever you, if you use the internet, you will have a very you know a lot of commands is there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I can see this. Yeah, there are a lot of commands for even for the e alphabet. There are A to Z, twenty-seven alphabets more. So just wait for a one or two days. I will show you a notification about that. Fine, fine, no problem. Because whatever you said on the EBS today, that completely, completely has gone through, not through my mind, above my mind actually. So that's okay. I'll, I'll manage it. Thank you. Yeah. So if you want that, I have one document. If you want to practice the email, uh, I'm uploading a document. You can refer. Okay. I have pasted in the chat section. Okay, thank you. That was wonderful, actually. Yeah, this is a complete exactly lab what we have done today. The same lab we have. Thank you, thank you, Lalit. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much, Lalit. Yeah, well, have, a, have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, Lalit. Have a nice time. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Yeah.